Welcome everyone to the Road by Road Garden Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the radio and the internet as well. Glad to have you this evening. Got Mama Hoss in the house. Mama Hoss, we're talking all things corn. Corn, my corn. favorite. Corn, it's time, y'all. Corn. If you haven't planted, if you ain't thinking about it, you need to be thinking about it. Have you planted yours? I have. Yep. You ready? I'm ready. Not a little too early? Not planted all of mine, but I planted my first crop. Oh. All right, so we're going to be talking about corn. We're going to be talking about corn in general because growing corn is the same whether you're going sweet corn or popcorn, or whatever. Growing the corn is the same with maybe the exception of the insect pressure. But we're going to be talking about growing corn. Then we're going to be talking about specifically sweet corn. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people out there, now you experienced gardeners, you know there's a difference between sweet corn and regular corn. But some of you new guys out there might not know, so we're going to touch on that in just a minute. But what's going on in the garden? My cucumbers I planted are up. Is your squash up? Squash is up. Mm -hmm. Squash is up. What about that cold spell this weekend? So we've got a cold spell coming in this weekend. It started out at 28 degrees for low, and they've changed it now to 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. But I think this is the last one of the year. I'm going to go on out of limb right here, and I'm going to say this is the last cold spell for us in Zone 8. For the spring. So are you going to cover up your squash? If it gets down to 30 degrees, I will probably cover up my squash because they're just coming up. Now I'm not planting my cucumbers, so I'm not planting my beans and all that. I got beets coming up. They'll so I fine. need to cover up my cucumbers? I would. I would. Uh, even at 33, when they just come up, they get a heavy frost, you can get some damage there. And no more than what we got planted. We, if nothing else, just throw some pine straw on top of them. So what about my strawberries that have blooms on them and little strawberries? Well, that'd be fine. That'd be fine? Oh, yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. What temperature would you worry about strawberries? Oh, it had to get down low, low. I'd say probably low 20s, maybe okay. high teens. Before. Somebody had asked me that question. Yeah, strawberries week. are very cold hearted. Okay. Yeah. But speaking of strawberries, they're... They're making. Mm -hmm. My strawberries are looking pretty good. Yours are Mine looking better. Mine looks much better than yours. Yeah. All that fish emulsion you don't yeah. believe in. Yeah. Well, no, I don't say I don't believe in it. I just did not have the opportunity to use it like you did. If you remember correctly, I was part of your strawberry planting. Well, I was pl just a laborer. No, you were just a laborer. You planted them. I have taken care of them. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And mine look much better than yours. But you know what? I think after this cold spell, this week, I'm all in. Green beans, we're talking cucumbers. Now, I'm not planting my cucumbers. And I got some novelty stuff I'm planting, such as uh, a couple of the cucumbers that we got in, the new cucumbers. We got one of them we're going to go over today is our new seed variety. And the other one is that striped lacasso or whatever that we got in. It's actually a melon, but you eat it as it matures a cucumber. I'm going to plant some of that. Now, I'm also going to plant cucumbers. This novelty stuff that I like to plant every year does not take the place of my staples, mm -hmm. which is we love pickles mm -hmm. or slicing cucumbers. So I will plant those, but I always like to plant some novelty -ish. Yeah, is I, that I'm word? low. Speaking of pickles, I'm low on pickles. Mm -hmm. So we need a good cucumber crop. Yeah, we got to kick it in on, on pickles this year because we eat a lot of pickles. Mm -hmm. We like to fish and we like to fry fish. And raw onion and pickles are my two favorite things to eat with fried fish. Mm -hmm. When we catch them. When we catch them, which we've been doing okay. Yeah. When you had the watermelon fiasco, we didn't catch any. No, we didn't catch any. But then a couple days later, we went. We did. All right, so let's talk about new seed varieties that we got up. Now, this one right here is the Austin's Red Pear. Uh, this is a new one for us, and if you guys remember... Red pear? Red pear, so... Tomato. Tomato, yeah. So the yellow the yellow pear, we have grown a lot, and we've really promoted it. It's an indeterminate. We love it. It's a small pear-shaped tomato. It's been one of our go-tos. However, I thought we needed a red. So this is a sister to the yellow one, but this one's just red. So we've got the Austin red pear, which is indeterminate. We also have got the Mexican Sour Gherkin. Now this is a uh, kind of a weird little, and I classify this as a novelty. This is one I just talked about a minute ago that I'm gonna grow a few of. It's, you pick it real small. It resembles a small watermelon when, when you go to pick it, when you need to pick it. 
And uh, you pick it very young when it's small, like a miniature watermelon. You eat the rind and all? You eat everything. And it's got this little citrusy taste to it. It's supposed to be really, really good. You ever had it? Never have. But I'm going to grow it this year. I'm excited about this one right here. Uh, so I'm going to grow a few plants of that. Can you grow that in a container? Or? You could, I'm assuming. I, I really don't know the grind, the vine growth on it. So I'm going to... That's a good question. I, I don't know why you couldn't. Okay. And then, the one we talked about last week, we've got... I thought we'd talk about this one more time. It is the Hoss Green Blaze Bush Bean. Now, we picked the name out last week mm -hmm. out of the top four that was... Yeah, I talked to another guy. Well, I talked to my guy. You always got to have a guy. Mm -hmm. I talked to my guy in the last week on this one right here again. I said, give me just a little bit more information because he's seen a lot of trials of it. He said, Greg, this bean will work in any slot. Now, if you ever talked to a commercial grower, they always talk about slots. That's what categorize seeds for slots, whether it be in an early slot, late slot, mid slot, or fall slot. So you can plant it all year. He says this bean will work in any slot. He said, but what really stands out is in heat set. So I'm going to go ahead and plant this as my first planting, and I'm probably going to turn around and do a second planting of it just to kind of see. Yeah, I need these, to can. Are those good for canning? These are great for canning because they're straight, they're consistent, and it's a dark green bean. So they're great And it's for stringless. Canning. And it's stringless. Okay. Yep. So that's going to be my go-to bean right there this year. And I'm going to compare growing it in the first slot as the first planting versus my second. Well, well, be my second, maybe my last spring slot. Okay. So we're talking about corn, folks. Look here. That's what we're talking That's about. That's our right favorite here. way to eat it. Mm -mm -mm. What you think? Pull that mm -hmm. just like that. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm hungry. <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, had any food if you eat all that, hours. you may have the belly ache. I may have. Now, let's go ahead and tell everybody what is in this. How do you prepare this? Okay, so when I, I cut it off the cob, I blanch it in the microwave for 10 minutes on medium power. And then I put it in the steel mill bags, drop it down in ice, and cool it. And that's it. Um, so when I get ready to cook it, I usually lay it out the night before. Um, you can defrost it if you uh, are behind. behind. Or in a tight. Or in a tight, yeah. Um, but probably a half a stick of butter, mm -hmm. probably a fourth a cup of cream, and I do cook it in the microwave on about 20 minutes on 30% power. Mm. And I'm gonna tell you what, my dad, which is 84 years old, this is his favorite vegetable. And this is a vegetable, did you know that? If it is eating, eating, if it is eating or consumed in the milk stage, which is the way we eat sweet corn, mm -hmm. is considered a vegetable. Let's talk about the nutrition. All right. It's high in you vitamin. You talk about that while I partake in right. the nutrition. It's high in vitamin C. Mm -hmm and fiber, which could cause a little issue there in about 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, it gets a bad rap because it's high in sugar and carbs. But it's a good sugar, in my opinion. It's not a processed sugar. No, it's not processed sugar. But for those of us that um, are diabetics, it kind of makes our blood sugar spike a little bit. Mm -hmm. Have to be careful. In other words, what you're saying is it will stick to your ribs. It will stick to your ribs and the tummy and everything else. So moderation is the key, mm. not the whole bowl. Yeah. But it does have a lot of fiber. Kind of offsets some of that. Yeah. 90 calories for an ear of corn. Oh, man, I tell you what, when corn's coming in, this is what I do. I go shut me a bunch of corn and I carry it down to the house and I put me a boiler outside. And I boil me up a bunch of corn and I will sit outside underneath my carport and I will just about make myself eat. He'll eat a row of corn. corn, not one ear of corn, a row of corn. Um, one gram of fat, one gram of fiber, three grams of protein. So it does have some protein in it. Got to offset it with some protein. 19 grams of carbs. Oh. Five grams of sugar. Mm. 
Now we like it boiled. Mm -hmm. We like it steamed. We like it grilled. Yep. But that's our favorite. Now we don't put corn on the cob up. No. Each to their own. We're not judging you if you do. Hey, more power to you. But we don't do that. We maximize our space in our freezer by using the cream corn. Mm -hmm. Now we love corn on the cob, but we only eat that in season. Where did corn come from? It's glad you asked. You know, I've done some, I've, I've often spoken here before. One of the things that really fascinates me as far as heirlooms go is corn and grains. And corn originated, believe it or not, in Central America and South America. Mm -hmm. And they think somewhere around Peru back down in there, and that would be Central America. It originated there, and when Christopher Hoss come over on the Mayflower, he actually discovered... Not the Hoss flower. Not the Hoss flower. Christopher Hoss come on the Mayflower. He actually <laughs> discovered Hulls. corn. So the Europeans didn't even know corn existed. So it actually originated over here on this side of the pond instead of the other side of the pond. So those guys over there, Germany mm -hmm. and all that, over there. And you know, the corn. first Thanksgiving in 1621, they had corn. Really? That's a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. They had cranberry sauce, I'm assuming. <laughs> it was an Indian corn, but it was corn. So a lot of the um, old heirlooms date back, and I've seen some people that have done some research on this. And on my bucket list, this is one of the things on my bucket list. I would love be to, moderation. Moderation. I would love to travel to Peru and Central America and do some research and find some of those old heirloom varieties of corn that are still used today. They are a good many of them out there. Even in Mexico, there's a good, a good many of heirlooms that we don't have here in the United States. Hmm. So that's just one of my, mm -hmm. of all the heirlooms out there, that's the only one that really piques my interest is the corn, is the corn. You ever heard of the Three Sisters technique? I've heard of it. We have a lot of people call and ask, will this corn work with the Three Sisters technique? Well, what exactly is Three Sisters technique? So where you plant corn, squash, and beans together. As like a companion plant? Mm -hmm. Like companion planting. So the beans grow up on the corn I get that. plant. I get that. The, and they provide the fertilization. Well, somewhat. Natural fertilizer. Yeah, somewhat. The squash serves as a ground cover for, to suppress weeds. They must be talking about a winter squash. Hmm, I'm not sure. Because your summer squash is not going to vine out. They must be, I bet they're talking about a winter squash. So a winter squash... But it is a companion planting tradition. I can see that on some of the winter squash because they would run underneath that and it would shade them so much so they're more prolific. Yeah. I get that. You get that? Okay. I get that. Now back in the day, in the early 30s and 40s and things like that, they used to plant a lot of corn and they would plant beans at the same time with the corn and the beans would grow up mm -hmm. on the corn stalk and they would harvest the corn, then when they would have the beans there, they'd turn the livestock in on, and the livestock would feed on those corn stalks and those beans. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of the old coal planters that you see, these old antique horse-drawn coal planters, will have two hoppers on them. And the reason for that is they had corn on one side and beans on this side, they planted in the same hill. Okay. Now you know. Now I know. So let's talk about corn, growing corn. Uh, if you're a beginner gardener, this may be one that you want to kind of stay away from until you get a little more experience under your feet there. I think there are some other crops out there that's easier to grow on a smaller scale than corn. Corn is one of those where you need a decent amount of air to grow. They say that you need at least four rows. My thing is I think you need at least six rows. You want to plant corn in blocks. And normally speaking, you don't want to plant less than about a 20 by 20. Now, I've seen it grown in containers, and we've had this discussion here in the office because some of the girls thought that was the most amazing thing, somebody grows some corn in a container. I think it's kind of a waste of your time and money to try to grow corn in a container. You need to grow your corn in a little bit. Because of pollination. Pollination, and it just takes... It pollinates takes, by the wind. It does, but not only that, but you're putting so much effort into growing something, you're just going to get maybe get one, two ears of corn, maybe, off a container where if you get something like an indeterminate or a tomato, you could harvest some tomatoes off of it for a long period of time. I just think it's more bang for the buck growing something else in a container than corn. Yeah. 
Especially as much as you eat at one setting. Yeah. That wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. I'd be eating a container loop just, <laughs> just a minute. So growing corn and growing watermelons is more for the experienced gardener that's got room to grow. Once you conquer growing watermelons successfully and corn successfully, you're at the pinnacle of your gardening career, mm -hmm. I think. I think those are the most complicated ones to grow, yet some of the most rewarding two crops to grow. How warm does the soil need to be before you plant the corn? Well, I normally, it's 55 to 65 degrees, somewhere in there. We normally go on dates, but there is, a, there is something to do with soil temperatures there. Some of the different types need to be planted at different soil temperatures, but pretty much, we just go by dates. Inch deep? Yeah, somewhere around an inch deep. Now, in my garden, if I, and I'm always planting on drip irrigation, by the way, I can plant a little bit shallower and get it up. Mm -hmm. In a garden situation, you don't want to plant as deep as what they do field corn in a field situation because a lot of the field corn has to rely on soil moisture to get it up, so they'll plant those a lot deeper. In my opinion, half inch to one inch is plenty in the garden. Three to four inches apart? That's what they say. That's what Google says. My ideal spacing on seed corn, if you had to get it ideal, is six inches apart. Mm -hmm. And how far apart the rows? 30 to 36 inches. I've done it both ways. This year, I planted mine on 36 inches. Last year, I planted on 30 inches. Either one will work. Just don't go closer than 30 inches. And if you go further than 36, you may have more of a weed problem because your corn don't... Um, shade out those weeds well so 30 to 36 inch row space perfect full sun full Got sun full sun. sun full sun don't let anybody convince you to plant it underneath a shade tree it's not going to do well there although it'd be handy to have when you get hot you can sit underneath mm -hmm. that shade tree but planting your full sun ph is a little bit more forgiving than some of the other things you can get by anywhere from 5.5 to 7.0 somewhere in there and water, gotta have water. Gotta have water. If you're doing overhead, they say again, this is what you read on the internet, an inch per week. An inch per week, it really won't get you by once it gets to making. You probably need a little bit more than that. Drip is the key. Drip irrigation is the key to be successful on corn growing. You never want your corn to wilt. What's gonna happen if your corn stresses, especially when it gets on up to uh, shoulder high or more when it starts tasseling? It's going to wilt, mm -hmm. and you never want to see that. So if you go wilting. out there and see your corn's wilted, are you done? Not done. I mean, you could bring it back, but it's definitely going to have an effect on your harvest, mm -hmm. on your on your yield. So you don't, we don't like to see that. And with drip irrigation, we can control that. Now, fertilization, you do pre-plant? Pre-plant, you can. A lot, of the post, a lot of the old timers believed in putting the fertilizer down when they planted. A lot of people still do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Personally, I prefer to side dress after my corn comes up, unless you got compost or using a chicken litter like our complete organic. You want to put that in a, a day or two before, or maybe up to a week before you plant. They kept those microbes get going. And how often do you fertilize? Well, if you're using a standard granular fertilizing, fertilizing program, you fertilize three times. They recommend you plant uh, fertilizing pre-plant. You do it at the sixth leaf stage and again at the third leaf stage. You bust your fertilizer requirements up into three different applications. Now what we like to do, and we're working on a corn growing guide for our Harvest University that I hope will be up soon. I believe with corn that you do need to do some type of granular application, whether it be our complete organic before you plant, or you could use something like a 10, 10, 10 granular fertilizer as a base. But also supplement that if you're using drip irrigation with a water soluble, excuse me, a water soluble through your drip tape. And that makes that corn even produce more better. More better. So what I like to do is a combination of the granular and injecting my fertilizer through there. Now, corn likes a lot of nitrogen, and the rookie mistakes people make when they're fertilizing is they don't give it enough nitrogen. Corn can take anywhere to five to eight units per thousand square feet. Another thing is phosphorus. Corn loves phosphorus. If you've ever grown corn and your leaves turn purple on the, after they got on up, you have more likely had a phosphorus deficiency. Potassium is important as well, but phosphorus is probably more, more important. 
So to do a soil sample and to find out where your phosphorus load is at is important for corn. If you've got a plot that's got a high phosphorus level, it's an ideal spot to plant your corn because it's going to use up some of that phosphorus. If you do the soil sample and your plot is not very high on phosphorus and potassium, then you pretty much want to stick to a well-balanced fertilizer, whether it be 10-10-10 or 20-20-20 throughout your fertility program to keep that corn going. If you've got a plot that's got a high phosphorus load before you plant, then you can rotate something like a 20-20-20 or a 10-10-10 with calcium nitrate, uh, Chilean nitrate is probably a better one, Bulldog soda, one of those straight nitrogens, you can supplement that there to get your nitrogen, but to maybe back off on your phosphorus, because you got a phosphorus load already. Okay. I hope that didn't get too complicated. Woo. Woo. You're passionate about that, aren't you? I'm passionate about that. A little shoo, shoo, over my head. Mm. Pest and diseases. Mm. Man. On field corn, I don't ever have any problem. What's I don't, that? I, I just, I just don't, I don't ever have any problem with field corn. I'm not saying this, people out there might have some issues there, would never spray field corn. On sweet corn, the only problem I have is that corn earworm. What helps if I get an early crop in, my corn, your, your corn earworm is going to be worse on those later plantings than they are that earlier plant. But that being said, some years are just different. We've had years well, we went out there and every year we pulled had a worm in it. And then we've had years where every year we went out there and did wasn't the first worm in none of them. That we did exactly right. the same. So just sometimes weather can, can cause those changes there. The controls you can do on that is twofold that I recommend. If you want to go organically, when that corn starts tasseling, you can use spinosad, which is our garden insect control, to spray. It's a stomach poison. And it's going to help control that worm. Or if you're not concerned about organic and one that works even more better no. is Bug Buster 2. You want to take Bug Buster 2 and when that corn is tasseling, you want to spray it over the top. Let it kind of float down. And that works really well too. Okay. If you do get a worm in that ear of corn. Don't throw it away. Don't throw it away. Just cut that out and eat the rest of it. We do it all the time. Harvesting. How do you know when your corn's ready? Normally speaking, three weeks after it tassels. But we always like to look at that ear of the corn and see that dark brown part on the ear of the corn. Is what we like to see, and we know it's ready. Plus, you can pull a little bit back and, and see. You press on that little kernel, and that milk pops out. You want it in that milk stage, speaking of that. Creamy and milky. Mm -hmm. mm. And preservation, we'll just touch on that. We prefer freezing and eating it on the cob fresh. Mm -hmm. We do can some of it in our soup. Yeah. But. Man. Yeah. If y'all have never done this right here, you need to, uh, that's more work. When you get ready to put it up, it's more work by all means. I think that's one reason people put it up on the cob because it's a lot less work. Mm -hmm. But it's worth it. Okay. Now the types of corn that there are, and we'll just touch on this and then we'll get into our sweet corn. This is pretty much the four types of corn. We got sweet corn and we got field corn. The field corn we're gonna say we're gonna separate that between dent corn and flint corn, and then we've got popcorn. So you got yeah. kind of four different types there. Now some of them can cross over. We know the one we talked about last week, that glass gem, is a flint that it can cross over as a popcorn as well. So categorize corn into those four different types here. Now let's dig into the different types of sweet corn because that is what most people want to grow in the garden. Mm -hmm. So there's four different. And we're going to throw up some uh, a summary of these as we go through them. Yeah, so y'all can kind of follow along. And if you want to save this for later, you can. All right, our first one is the SU. Sugar. Sugary. Sugary. Okay. Now this one has an average sugar level of uh, 8 to 18%. This is the most popular of all the sweet corn out for the home gardener. This is the type you want to freeze. Yeah, it tends to do better if you're going to, uh, if you're going to freeze it the way we put it up. Comes as both hybrids and open pollinators. 
it is like we talked about, it's the traditional type of sweet corn. Yeah, they call it the old fashioned flavor. Mm -hmm. Is that starchiness to it? Mm -hmm. Kernels are tender and creamy and can become sh chewy and sugary. It does not store well. That's one thing. Yeah, if you, this type, you when you pick it, you want to eat it that day. Yeah. And if you are growing some of the more advanced type corn, such the S SH or the SY, you want to keep these isolated from those. I really shouldn't even touch on that because people get all hung up on cross-pollination. It didn't matter a whole lot unless you're saving the seeds. So it's really shouldn't even be. So what's that. some of the sugary types we carry? Oh, silver queen. So silver queen, My which favorite. has always been our old time favorite. But we've grown more silver queen than we have anything else over our lifetime. And that is a uh, issue variety. Also stole evergreen, which is uh, a lot of people up north grow this one. Mm -hmm. And also we carry it in the G90. The G90, a lot of people love the G90. These I are, think that's what this is, is G90. It, you know, I believe it is. Yep. So I did grow the G90 mm -hmm. last year. Um, those are part of the SU. And we love it for this right here. Cream corn. Yep. Okay, the next one we have is the Sugar Enhanced or the SC. Now this is the ones that have a little bit increased sugar level of 30% to 35%. And the kernels are tender. The sugar is slower to become starch after harvest. Has a little bit longer shelf life. Yeah, you can than the issue. Save it for three to four days. Mm -hmm. They're sweeter, and um, they're good corns. Now, some of the varieties we have, and, and when I say this name, here, everybody's going to recognize this: peaches and cream, because mm -hmm. a lot of people love the peaches and cream variety, and it is a great name. Um, Ambrosia. Now that's a that's one we love to plant. These in are bicolors. As a bicolor, that we love to grow that one in the fall. I have found that ambrosia does great for me in that fall slot. Inca incredible candy corn, bodacious, silver king. A lot of people think silver king and silver queen are the same type corn, but they're not. Hmm. And then argent. Okay, the next one we're gonna go to is the shrunken or the sh, and this is the ones that have even more sugar. 40 to 50% compared to the sugary varieties. They have a crisp texture. They can be kept for up to a week. So as we start getting into more- They're of, not as creamy. I don't like them as well because they don't have that. They're more crunchy. They're more crunchy. They're, I think they're more designed to be eaten fresh off the top. Mm. Because these varieties here were developed for the large farmers for the fresh market. So when you go into Walmart, Home Depot, not Home Depot, don't sell corn. <laughs> Your big <laughs> chain stores, you go into there, these, these are the ones you're gonna find mm -hmm. right here. And the reason is they got that long shelf life and they are, um, they just tend to be for boiling, eating fresh, that's what they, they, they mm -hmm. tend to be for. So that would be Obsession. Obsession, Avalon, Passion, and Devotion. Now some people, especially on the Obsession, cause the most popular variety from a grocery store of obsession. I've heard I've heard different reports on this. Somebody would tell me that's grown a lot of it, said it lacks flavor. Said it's one of the blandest corns, mm. commercially grown corns that are out there. Then I have a customer call that grew it last year that just raves about it. So I've got It just depends on what you grew up with and what you like. I, I guess, think. I don't know. I've had, I've had, of all the corns out there, I've had more conflict and reports on the, the eating quality of, of uh, obsession. Um, all right, so let's move on to the fourth synergistic varieties. Is this what they call the triple sweet? Uh, I think so. Let me get me up. No, so they have a combination of the sweetness mm -hmm. genes. Um, they're very sweet, crisp, tender, and creamy. Yep, and have the longest of all shelf lives. Mm -hmm. You can keep them up to uh, more than a week in the fridge. Yeah. Now, if you pick them too early, that kernel's going to be like watery. So it's not going to be good. It's not going to be like the SU's to Silver Queens and all that if you pick it too early. It's something that you want to be pretty much on your game with. Okay, so now we've touched on the four different types. Uh, let's talk about the different types of synergistic we have. Okay. Tetris, Primus, Providence, Yellowstone, Serendipity. Ooh, and that a good one. Eating and Navarra. Nirvana. Nirvana. 
that I see behind mm -hmm. me. So we've got a pretty good selection in all these four different yep. types. Yep. Now I will say this also, if you're starting growing out corn here, in my opinion, the SU varieties such as the Silver Queen, Stoles Evergreen, and G90s are probably the easiest to grow. Some of these triple sweets and uh, real sweeter corns can be more complex to grow. So if you're a more experienced gardener, by all means try them. We've tried them before, we like them. We just kind of moved back and forth. Now this year, I'm planting a new variety that I can't release. I've already got it planted. I can't talk about it because we don't have it. And I'm trialing it to see if it's going to be uh -huh. worthy of us carrying this. Which it, is it a triple sweet? It's an SH2. And it can highly recommend it. And we're growing it out this year. And we let everybody know how well it does and see if it's worthy of us carrying it next year. I kind of want to try it before I took somebody's word on it. Mm -hmm. So maybe that will help you, you know, figure out which one you want to grow. Kind of give you a little cone education anyway. What about the old goat, Sheila? We forgot to mention the old goat. Old goat? Is he here this week? I think he's here. You reckon anybody's found him? I don't know. So last week we had over 30 people find the old goat. So I'm going to draw for, oops, a hat for... Who wins the hat this week? And it is over the hoopy farm. Over the hoopy farm. Found the old goat and gets a free hat. Yep. Send customer service your address. All right. And we'll get that. Corny joke. Well deserved hat out to you. Corny joke of the week. Mm, I'm ready. Ready. Now, I've not been exposed to this corn joke. Okay. Mm -hmm. How is an ear of corn like an army? How's an ear of corn like an army? Oh, I got this one. It has a lot of kernels. Yeah! I got that one. Got Finally one. got one. Of all the corny jokes, I think that's the first one yeah. I've ever got. Both have a lot of kernels. Yep. All right. Next week, everybody, we've got Tracy from Sakata coming in to be on the show. We're going to give Mama Hoss a break. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, every time we get the opportunity to have Tracy on here, she is a wealth of information. We're looking real forward to that. So make sure you tune in for that. And we've got a couple of events we need to talk about. Okay. Yep. Uh, Petals in the Past, April 23rd. Uh, it's a bunch of YouTubers, uh, antique show, nursery show. There's a link below to RSVP if you're going, it's free. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and then the Oki Homestead and Expo. When is that? March 9th? Not 19th. 19th. Okay. Yep, we'll have some of our pe pe peoples out there to that. We're not going to be able to make it, but uh, a lot of our good friends will be there. We'll have a booth, some giveaways. Yep. yep. All right, just to recap real quick, because I was wanting to touch on this and I didn't get around to it. When to plant corn. Okay, if you're in zone nine, you still got time to plant corn. You probably already should have it planted, but you still got time. Zone eight, plant your corn now if you're in zone eight. Zone seven, mid to March to late March, around the first of April. And you got time for these later slots in there. So I'm just giving you an example of when you need to start planting corn. Zone six, middle of April to the end of April. Zone five and four, you guys plant sometime in May. Y'all know better than what I do. But think about growing you some corn. Next week, I think everybody here in zone eight is going to, I got tomatoes up like that. Mm. I'm going to have tomatoes ready in a week. Some of the horse tomatoes ready probably next week. To plant? I think so. So next week, we're all in on planting everything around here because we think the cold spell's gone. What you think? I'm ready. All right. Thank you for watching. That's time for you to get out there and get dirty.